Dear brothers and sisters, we can't help but thank God for you because your faith is flourishing and your love for one another is growing. We proudly tell God's other churches about your endurance and faithfulness and all the persecutions and hardships you are suffering. And God will use this persecution to show his justice and to make you worthy of his kingdom for which you are suffering. In his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you. And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. Well, good morning and welcome to Christ Church. It's so good to be able to see you this morning. If you're new around here, my name's Jason. I'm one of the pastors on staff. And I'm thrilled that you carved some time out of your busy schedule to kind of hang out with us on a Sunday morning. And what a Sunday morning it has already been. Uh, we got to baptize somebody this morning. Uh, give it up for Kendall. Kendall made a decision for Jesus. He got baptized just a few minutes ago. It's awesome. And then also last hour, we had our family dedication service down in our Mandarin room. Uh, we had 25 kids that were brought forward this morning to be dedicated. Let's give it up for all those new parents. Come on. Now you know who to be praying for, all right? And where to volunteer. We need you in the nursery, just saying, all right? But man, it's uh, been a fun morning, and today's gonna keep on going. We, it's Starting Point Sunday, and what that means is if you're new around here, wanna get connected, wanna take a, another step in your spiritual journey to become a better disciple, I mean, this is a, a, a great place to go. And so you can just show up today, you get free lunch, you get to hang out with me. If you're watching from our campuses, get to hang out with Josh and Lucas and learn a little bit more about our church and how you can get plugged into this great faith community. So I wanna invite you to join us and listen to any time. If you're sitting here, you're going, you know what? I need to go to Starting Point. You can just take out your phone and tap that tag on the chair in front of you and you can register for Starting Point at any time. Or if you bring one of your five, definitely encourage them to do that as well. Uh, we're also in a Christmas season, can you believe? We're just like six weeks away uh, from Christmas. I know, I know, I know, it's getting here quickly. And so we're in the midst of our Christmas shop season. And this is something we do every year to provide Christmas, a dignified Christmas for some families in our community that need assistance. And so this year, God has given us a, a really big, amazing vision. And we're partnering with six, that's right, six, Title I schools in Clay County and Duval County to be able to provide a thousand, that's right, a thousand kids a very special Christmas. And so if you've not heard about it, now you're hearing about it, we'd love to get you involved. An easy way to get involved is just go at one of our campuses to our displays. You can grab one of these little snowflakes and on the snowflake there's a QR code and you can just scan that and it will take you to our website where it'll share with you how you can get toys. And if you love to go shopping, that's your thing, then you can go shopping, get the presents on your own, but if you're like me, you can just go to Amazon, order them, and the, the elves will deliver them here to Christ Church, all right? And so you can do that. If you wanna volunteer, we need volunteers. We're doing six of these, they're not on our campuses, they're actually in the schools, and so we need volunteers. So if you wanna be a part of this by, by being generous with your time, by volunteering, or being generous with your resources, by purchasing gifts, I hope you'll do that. You can just go to our website or grab one of these. Also, I wanna take just a moment before we get into the service anymore to say thank you to some people who usually don't like to be thanked or recognized. But this is a, a special week. This is a week where we, we remember our veterans. And so that's one of the reasons I love this church and this community of believers is that this church is filled with veterans. And so we wanna take a moment to recognize the veterans. You men and women who've served our armed forces, would you stand so we can say thank you uh, for your service to all of our veterans? Would you please stand where you're at? Awesome. Woo. If you're in active duty right now, if you're in active duty, would you stand and join them? If you're in active duty, active duty, active duty. Come on, there we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so, so, so very much. And as I said, I love that this church is filled with families uh, who, who serve that way. And thank you for your sacrifices. Uh, thank you for uh, your service. Uh, thank you for protecting our freedoms here domestically and around the globe. Uh, thank you so much for all you do and all you give. And families, I know all the things that you sacrifice as well to support someone. And so I just wanna say a big Christ Church thank you to all of you who serve our military. And we recognize our veterans and we thank you very much. Well, listen, we, we're jumping into the second letter that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica today. And as we're doing that, let me ask you a question to get started. 
Have you ever had one of those moments where you just freak out? You know what I'm talking about? You ever had one of those moments where you just panic? Capture that in your mind, all right? Because I don't know when the last time you've had one of those moments, maybe it was yesterday, maybe it was last month, maybe it was last year. And maybe it kind of happened like this. Maybe you got a phone call and you're on the phone and you're receiving some news and you're speechless. And then you put that phone down and you're sitting there and your whole world is spinning and it's out of control. You don't know which way's up and which way's down. It feels like you've got no ground underneath your feet. I mean, you're trying to think, but you can't put a thought together. You're trying to form a word, but you can't form a single word. And you find yourself in that moment of panic and freaking out, paralyzed, frozen. Or, or maybe this has been your experience. Maybe you were driving down 95 during the middle of a tropical storm, driving 75 miles an hour in your F-250, and you hit some water. And the next thing you know, your truck is sideways and you're sliding down 95 in the wrong direction. And in those moments, moments of panic, moments of fear, what do we do? So many times what do we do is we lock up. We freeze up, we find ourselves paralyzed. And it's in those moments that we have to find this ability to be calm, to make the right decision, the best decision, so not only can we get through that moment so that we don't make another decision that compounds our situation and it makes it all the worse. You know the most repeated phrase in the Bible? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You know they say it shows up in the Bible 365 times. I don't think that's coincidence. I think it's like one for every single day of our lives. Need to be reminded, do not be afraid. And here's what's interesting. So many times we see fear in the Bible. You know what accompanies fear? Someone being frozen. Someone being paralyzed. In fact, one of the greatest examples of this is at Jesus' tomb. When they buried Jesus in the tomb, the local leaders heard what Jesus said, that three days later, he's gonna rise from the dead. And so to ensure that that doesn't happen, what the local leaders do is they put some, some guards, some Roman guards, some experienced weathered soldiers standing in front of that tomb so none of his followers, Jesus' followers, will show up, steal his body, and claim that Jesus was resurrected. And what we know from Scripture is his followers didn't show up but his angels did. And when his angels showed up in the glory of God, the Bible records that those, those hardened, weathered soldiers fell to the ground, paralyzed. The Bible says they laid there like dead men. And so as we jump into this second letter that Paul writes to this, this young church, this fledgling church in the city of Thessalonica, persecution had set in. And the persecution hadn't got easier. It actually continued to, to intensify and get worse and worse and worse. And as that persecution began to set in, fear began to set in as well. And as that fear began to, to set in, they were paralyzed, spiritually paralyzed, spiritually frozen. And, and that joy and that excitement that they once had in following Jesus, it was beginning to wane. And so Paul's message to this young group of believers going through tough times is the same message that I believe Paul has for you and for me today. He says, don't give up. Don't be afraid. Don't throw in the towel. Don't quit. He says, keep calm and carry on. Keep calm and carry on. And you're going, well, I've heard of that term. In fact, you see posters on it, T-shirts on it. Keep calm and carry on. You see the, the little crown on top. And so many times people are like, well, where does that come from? What's the origin of that? Well, the crown ought to give it away a little bit. It actually came from World War II in London, England. It was during World War II, during the uh, tragic days in the city of London. And, and Winston Churchill, the leader of England at the time, he gave this famous never give in speech. Maybe you remember it, never give in, never give in, never, 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 never in nothing great or small, large or petty, never, ever, ever give in. And he delivered that speech in October of 1941. And the reason he delivered that speech is because what they had been enduring for the past year. You see, a year prior to that, the Germans took France and then they set their sights on England. And their hope was that they would be able to take England, that they would be able to, to bring them to their knees, to cause them to, to surrender because they would create such fear that there would never even be a battle. And so the Germans, what they decided to do was to bomb London over and over and over again, 57 nights in a row. 
bombers would fly low over London, dropping thousands of thousands of bombs, and, and all the sirens would be going off, and people would be running for the subway to, to, to hide there, to sleep there. They put on the gas mask night after night, day after day, just constant bombardment, constant suffering. And in the middle of that, you had this leader, Winston Churchill, constantly calling his people to never give in. And it was out of that that these signs began to appear all through London that simply said, stay calm, stay calm, keep calm, and carry on. And that became the way they, they approached it. It became the way they, they addressed this issue, the suffering that they were, it's the way they started to, to look at all these bombings, just keep calm and carry on. We're gonna get through this. We're gonna make it through this together. And so I believe Paul was coming to this young group of believers who were facing hardships and persecutions and difficulties. He's saying, hey guys, keep calm. This is to be expected. The hardship, the suffering, the persecution, all the problems you're dealing with in your life, it's what always happens. So keep calm and carry on. What you're doing, how you're living, you're crushing it. You're doing it right. So keep calm and carry on. I think that was Paul's message to them and I think it's Paul's message to us here today. So let's jump in our Bibles. We're gonna be in the book of 2 Thessalonians. If you haven't found Thessalonians yet, turn to the book of Revelation, the very back of your Bible. Hang a left a few pages. Now, 2 Thessalonians might be hard to find because it's like only one page. There's only three chapters in this uh, little book that Paul wrote. If you have your workbooks, page 70. And let me just remind you who wrote these letters. It was the Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul wasn't always known as the Apostle Paul. One time he was a guy named Saul. And he wasn't for Jesus, in fact, he was against Jesus. And he was against Jesus' people. The book of Acts records that Paul actually was killing, killing Christians. And one day he was on his way to do more of that when Jesus interrupted his travels and showed up and, and revealed himself to Paul in a bright light, blinded Paul. And he looked at Paul and saw and said, dude, what are you doing? You're doing the wrong thing. I didn't make you for this. And so what he did is he renamed him and said, you're no longer Saul, you're not gonna be Paul. And he gave him a new mission. He aimed him in a new direction. He said, now your purpose in your life is to tell the Gentiles the good news of Jesus. Listen, everyone's journey is different. I look at Paul's journey and like scratch my head, like why, wow, God. And so just remember that people in your life, the journey they're on, the journey that God has them on, just give them grace as God has lead them towards what he has for them. And man, this guy, this guy, Saul became Paul. And he became one of the greatest missionaries ever known. In fact, the book of Acts records the three trips that he took to share the good news of Jesus Christ throughout Asia, and Asia Minor, and Greece, and Rome. And what we see in, in chapter 16 and 17, as he's on his second missionary journey when the Holy Spirit gives him a vision of a man in Macedonia in Greece who's saying, please come here and share the good news of Jesus Christ with us. We need Jesus in Greece. And so Paul and Timothy and Silas, they pack up and they head to, to Macedonia, which is the northern region of, of Greece, and they head to the capital city, which is the city of Thessalonica. And Thessalonica isn't a village, it's a city, the second largest city in all of Greece. Very important, prominent city. It's a port city. It's also on the Via Ignatia, which in modern terms, it's like I-95. I mean, it's literally the road that goes all the way from Europe to Asia. It's where all the commerce, all the travel, it's where all the business would be done. And so, so this port and this road all runs through the city of Thessalonica. So goods and services and ideas and philosophies all come through the city. And Paul shows up here. And Paul shares the good news of Jesus Christ. And the, the Bible says he turned the city upside down. That people, Jews and Gentiles were like, were receiving the gospel and the city is being turned upside down, but not everybody was happy about this. So they chased Paul out of town. And so Paul leaves these young fledgling disciples of Jesus Christ behind and his heart's broken because he knows what they're experiencing. He knows that he's, they're living through tough, intense persecution. And so he writes them a letter. It's springtime when Paul writes this first letter to this young group of believers in Thessalonica. And then a few months later, he hears that this persecution hasn't subsided. It's actually intensified. And some of the followers, they were beginning to drift. And so Paul writes them in late summer, a second letter. And that's where we get the book of 2 Thessalonians. And so why? I mean, what is this second letter all about? Well, it's a little bit more of the same of the first. He starts out by encouraging them. 
Paul's a pastor, he's an encourager. He wants to encourage them to keep on doing what they're doing, motivating them by, by recognizing the positive and saying more of that, more of that. You keep doing that. But he also recognizes that some of the things that he taught them, they weren't applying. They were struggling with some ideas, they were struggling with some concepts, especially around the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it was like they were hearing things, but they weren't doing things. And isn't that the case in our lives so many times? We hear stuff over and over and over again. I got it, right? I got it. I, I don't need to hear this anymore. I, I get it. I, I know what you're talking about. But so many times it's that place of confidence. It's that place of strength that we end up finding our greatest failures. You see, that's what the enemy does. The enemy looks for our greatest strength, and that becomes his greatest target in our life. The thing that we think we're strong in, the thing that we're confident in, that's what he goes after. And if we don't guard that strength, it becomes a, a, a double negative. It can take us down. Look at Abraham. Abraham, the father of many, right? The father of nations. And what is Abraham known for? His faith. But if you read his story, man, he bombed in his faith multiple times. You've had David, the giant slayer, the man after God's own heart, this incredible king of, of the entire country of Israel. But at a time when kings were supposed to be at war, David wasn't. And that led to adultery, which led to murder, which led to a lifetime of pain. And then there's a guy by the name of Samson. He's got this divine strength, but he's gotta keep this vow. He's gotta protect this vow, but he gave this vow away all for a one night stand. Listen, so many times our place of greatest strength is exactly where the enemy attacks. And when we think we got it, when we think we're strong, the enemy says, hey, I'll show you. And that place of strength becomes a weakness. And so we gotta be careful not to think, I got it. And I think that's what Paul is saying here. I know you've heard me. I know you've, you've, you've seen what I've said, but guess what, guys? You're not applying what you know. It's not about knowledge. It's about application. And so I think Apostle Paul is looking at these young believers saying, guys, okay, I need you to apply this. And here's what I need you to know. Don't panic. Don't give in. Don't give up. Keep calm and carry on. And so let's jump in. Chapter one, verse one of the second letter Paul wrote to these believers in Thessalonica. And here's what it says. It says, this letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Now, that's the normal crew that's been, been traveling with Paul on the second missionary journey, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. He says, we're writing to the church in Thessalonica to you who belong to God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Now, this greeting is a typical greeting. You read through a lot of the New Testament and Paul's letters to churches, it's a typical greeting. But what's unique about this is there's only two examples of Paul writing two letters to the same church. So one is this church in Thessalonica, but the second one is from the city of Corinth. And guess where Paul is writing this second letter from? The city of Corinth. And so two times, Paul writes two letters to two churches, and they're connected here in this second letter. Well, let's see what it says in verse three. It continues, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, we can't help but thank God for you because your faith is flourishing. Say flourishing. Your faith is flourishing and your love for one another is growing. Say growing. We proudly tell God's other churches about your endurance and faithfulness in all the persecutions and hardships that you are suffering. You see what he's saying here? He's saying, man, we can't help but to tell your story. We can't help everyone we run into, every church we come to, every other believer in Jesus Christ that, that we come across, we are telling about you. And, and, and what is he saying? He's saying, man, you're never gonna believe these people. These people in Thessalonica, young believers, we are there three weeks, they're experiencing incredible persecution, they're getting kicked in the teeth every single day, but they keep getting back up. And the reason they are thriving, the reason they keep getting back up, Two things, number one, a flourishing faith, a flourishing faith. You see, remember who these people are. They didn't grow up in church. They didn't go into Sunday school. They didn't have flannel graphs. They didn't grow up on the veggie tails, all right? They didn't come into places like this with chairs or pews, with, with Bibles, they didn't even have a Bible. They had nothing. The only thing these people had was Jesus. The only thing they had was the gospel. And so every single thing in their life was framed around the gospel. 
their lives, their purpose, their jobs, their marriages, their kids, their families, their time, their money, every single thing in their life was framed around Jesus. And their faith was flourishing. That means it was growing. They had a flourishing faith, but there was a second thing they had as well. They had a growing love. He's like, man, you guys have community. You guys are locking arms with one another. You have a, a gospel-centered, Jesus-centered community. And you know, because you've been experiencing it, that no matter what you face, no matter how difficult it gets, you can lock arms with those people and you will get through this together. And so Paul is saying, man, I'm telling everyone about you because you have figured it out. You're going through tough times, you're going through bumpy times, and you're holding on to two things. You're holding on to a flourishing faith and a growing love. It's the handlebars. The handlebars we need to hold on to when we're going through tough, bumpy times. Quick question, how many of us have ever ridden a bicycle? Anybody? Just making sure you're awake at 11 o'clock. All right, good. All right, most of us learned to ride a bike early in life, right? You have those moments where you go out and you have those training wheels on the side, eventually you take the training wheels off. I grew up on a bicycle. I mean, that was back in the days where everywhere I went for years, all the way up until I got my license, I was on a bicycle. And so I became really, really comfortable on a bicycle, doing all kinds of things, all kinds of tricks. And I would ride often without my hands on the handlebars. You see, when you ride with your hands off your handlebars, you gotta ride with balance, right? You gotta have the right balance. But I love having my hands free when I'm riding my bike because then I can talk to my friends with my hands and then I can, you know, I can get my Walkman hit play so I can listen to my MC Hammer as I ride down the street. And so I was hands free, but here is what I learned the hard way. I mean, here's what you know as well. When you're riding your bike hands free, not holding on the handlebars and, and you hit a bump or you hit a, a rock in the road or a car comes out or one of your friends comes up to be funny and, and kicks your wheel, what's gonna happen if your hands aren't on the handlebars? You're going down. I've got scars and, and receipts from the ER to prove that that's what happens when you don't hold on to the handlebars when you're going through bumpy times. And I think that's exactly what Paul is trying to help them to understand. And when you're going through bumpy times, man, you guys have got it figured out. You've got a flourishing, growing, thriving faith and you have found community, you found a partnership, you found this connection through, through your growing love for one another and that's what's helping you get through these tough times. Because the truth is, tough times are a reality. And they were going through it. They were suffering persecution and hardships and, and difficulties and problems. And these weren't light problems. These were real problems. This wasn't, hey, they, the barista got my coffee order wrong. I mean, this wasn't, you know, I can't get in the pool today because it's, you know, it's only 82 degrees. Or man, oh my goodness, the sun's not out today in Florida, so I need to bring a jacket with me. It's not it took the Jags six weeks to win a game, all right? I mean, these are real soul-shattering problems. But here's what I've seen just through my experience. So many times we are suffering adverse. We're suffering adverse. The moment it gets hard, the moment it gets difficult, the mo moment we experience some hardships, the moment we have some pushback, the moment it gets real, we eject, we're gone. We're out. It gets tough at work, we don't like a coworker, we don't like the boss, we're out. We have some friends that we don't agree with, we don't like, we just, we eject, we're gone. We'll find some new friends. We don't get along with our spouse. Going through a tough time, we just eject. It's just easy for us to run because somewhere in our mind, here's what we've been taught or we've learned or we've grabbed a hold of. Suffering is bad, suffering is wrong, suffering is not God's plan. Can I ask you an honest question? Where'd you read that? Who told you that? I mean, I'll tell you what I've read in the Bible. Out of the mouth of God himself in the flesh, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have trouble. Jesus said, if you're my disciple in this world, guess what? The world will hate you. Does that sound like a hunky-dory, problem-free life? Hakuta Matata? No. It sounds like life is hard and suffering is real and we are going to experience it. If there's anybody who understood persecution, suffering, hardship, and problems, it was the Apostle Paul. I mean, this guy experienced it. 
And, and listen to what, what he learned about this. Listen to what he said about his suffering and the persecution that he, he experienced. He said this to the church in Rome. He said, we can rejoice too. We can be happy too. We can find joy too when we, we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance, perseverance. And endurance and perseverance develop strength of character and character strengthens our confident what? Hope, our hope of salvation. Can I just say something? And this is from personal experience. Personal experience, and I've had a lot of this over the last couple of years. That when you experience problems and hardships and difficulties and persecution, it's fantastic if, if you have a flourishing faith and a growing love. But if you go through those same problems and difficulties and challenges and persecutions and you don't have a flourishing faith and a growing love, my heart goes out to you because you have nothing to hold on to. I mean, I run into people all the time, couples going through incredibly intense marriage issues where things have been brought into their marriage, things they didn't expect. Whether it's a secret sin or an addiction or infidelity, it's been brought into their marriage and, and they're struggling to just survive. I run into people who are dealing with death, planning funerals for a loved one, a parent, spouse, child, trying to wrap their heads around it all, or people grieving after they've buried someone they love. I, mean, I run into people who are struggling through sickness, cancer, or chronic pain. They're just looking for answers. They're just looking for a little bit of nugget of hope. They're just looking for that one report, that run test that will come back and tell them something good. And so many times I look at these people who are going through these things and they don't have a flourishing faith. They don't have a, 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 a community of people of growing love around them and they have no hope. And my heart just breaks for them. I mean, they might have karma or coincidence or happenstance or luck, but those aren't gonna give you answers. Those aren't gonna give you hope. Those aren't gonna give you direction. Those aren't gonna give you what you're looking for. And Paul's saying, no, when you're going through these times, you're dealing with difficulties and hardships and persecutions. You need the flourishing faith and you need this growing love because it gives meaning, it gives purpose to what God is doing in your life. Because if you have no community, you have nobody to share it with, and, and you have no faith, and ultimately you have no hope. And so I think what Paul is trying to teach these young believers, I think what he's trying to remind you and I about is that when we're going through these moments, we're going through these sufferings and hardships and persecutions in life, it's not meaningless. There's meaning, there's purpose in it. God is trying to do something in it. He's trying to grow something in us that so many times there's no other way it can be grown and developed in us unless he allows that in our life. And we've come through those moments. Every one of us in this room knows. We've gone through those difficult moments of life and we've said, I'll never do that again, but I'm thankful because I wouldn't be who I am today. And listen, a disciple of Jesus Christ with a growing, flourishing faith and this, this growing love, we may not like it, we may not always understand it, but we get it. I mean, if you came to me and said, hey, Pastor Jason, I'm struggling. I've been working out and working out, but I looked in the mirror the other day and my muscles aren't getting very big. First of all, I'd say, I don't know why you're coming to me about that one, all right? But secondly, I'd say, all right, well, where'd you start? And you'd say, well, you know, I went to the gym and I grabbed some five pound dumbbells and started doing some curls and some presses and some squats and some lunges. And I'm like, oh, great, I mean, what are you doing now? Well, I go to the gym and I pick up the five pound dumbbells and I do some curls and some presses and some squats and some lunges. I'm like, you're still using the same five pound dumbbell? Well, no wonder. No wonder you're not growing. No wonder your muscles aren't getting bigger because the only way you're gonna grow your muscles is when those muscles are stretched. When you put such a load on those muscles that requires them to, to use every bit of fiber of those muscles, then, then your muscles will grow. And that's what suffering and hardship and difficulties and problems in life do for us. Our suffering is not pointless. Your suffering is not pointless. God is not wasting this moment in your life. God is gonna use every bit of that. Even though he didn't send it, he's gonna allow it. He's gonna allow that in your life. And sometimes it's easy for us to think that God is out to lunch. 
that God's up in heaven going, whoa, whoa, what happened over here? I didn't see that coming. Or, oh my goodness, I mean, I wasn't paying attention. Everything over here spiraling out of control. That's not God. God is good and God is always in control. And sometimes we may not, we may not like it, sometimes we may not understand it, but God is doing something in us and through us when we're going through suffering. And here's what I've learned. God's not trying to protect me. God is preparing me. God isn't protecting me. He's preparing me for what is next. And I think that's what Paul's trying to do. Is like, guys, this isn't gonna end. It's gonna continue. Listen to what he says as he continues on. In verse four, he says this. He says, we proudly tell God's other churches about your endurance and your faithfulness and, and all the persecutions and hardships that you're suffering. I mean, we're proud of you. We're telling other people about you. You're crushing it. I mean, we're telling them to be like them, to do what they're doing because they have found honor in their suffering. And because they are suffering and suffering well, their voice is powerful. Listen, if you tell a friend about Jesus who doesn't know Jesus and your life is hunky-dory, great. But if you're going through it, you just come through a massive marriage issue where you've just rescued your marriage from the depths of, of, of failure, or you just come through a health crisis, or you just buried a loved one, and then you tell someone about Jesus, listen, you have street cred. People are gonna listen to you because you're coming from a place of realness and suffering and authenticity. They're gonna listen to you, but there's a difference. There's a difference. And listen, I know a lot of your stories I mean, I've been around this church for 23 years. I've walked through a lot of stuff with a lot of you. And I can look around this room and know some of those people who are watching our online community. And I know some of the highs and lows, some of the valleys you guys have gone through. I know some of the battles that you fought through with kids and marriages and, and sin and addictions. I know some of the, the stuff that you've done. And listen, when you come to somebody and you share the goodness of God and how you've got this incredible faith community around you, you've got street cred. People are gonna listen to the good news of Jesus Christ, because you're coming from a place of, hey, I get it. It's not all rainbows and unicorns. Life is tough and life is hard. But what you need, you need a flourishing faith. You need growing love. Because the truth is, when we suffer well, we share Jesus well. When we suffer well, we share Jesus well. There is purpose, there's a point to our suffering, not just in our life, but to the gospel being shared. And so as I think Paul's encouraging, say keep calm and carry on, keep doing these things. You keep growing in your faith, flourishing your faith. You keep growing in your love. But I think there's a second message that Paul's about to, to share. And the best way for me to illustrate this is to ask you this question. How many of you have siblings? Raise your hands, siblings. All right, here's the follow-up question. And this is really a dumb question, but I'm just gonna say it. How many of you have ever fought with your brother or sister? And we all laugh, yeah, absolutely, right? I have a little brother and sister. My, my, my brother's 13, his name's Zach. He's 13 years younger than me. And so I was really too old to really argue and fight with him. But my little sister, she's three and a half years younger than me. Different story. You know, I was the, the big brother and, and my little sister, and man, my sister Amanda, she's awesome. So proud of her. The woman that she's grown into, I mean, she's a, a leader of an international organization that cares for, for kids and families with this disease called Angelman's. I mean, it's, it's amazing what, what she does. But man, when she was little, I used to love to pick on her. And as a big brother, I always knew that she had a temper, all right? And so I could come along and just prod just a little bit, just a little bit and pick, just a little bit and pick a little bit, because I knew eventually it was gonna add up and then she was gonna lose it. And I just, I, I relished that moment where she just lost it because in that moment I knew she was gonna do something stupid and get herself in trouble. And I was gonna sit back and laugh at her and get in trouble. But what had happened so many times is we find ourselves I mean, picking back and forth and picking back and forth and, and, and these things would, would escalate and escalate and almost every single time this is how it ended. One of us locked in the bathroom, yelling through the door, wait till dad gets home. Wait till dad gets home. Because here's what we knew, dad would bring justice, Dad would make all things right. Now, Dad couldn't took away what had happened, but Dad would make everything right. And I think this is the second message that Paul is delivering here. Not just keep calm and carry on, but wait till Dad gets home. Wait till Dad gets home. And listen to what he says as we continue. He says, and God will use this persecution to show his justice and to make you worthy of his kingdom for which you're suffering. He's saying, you're going through it. 
Stay calm, carry on, but wait till dad gets home. The suffering you're experiencing is like a badge of honor. And so many times when we're going through suffering, we're asking ourselves the why question. Why is this happening to me? God, why are you doing this? God, why are you allowing this in my life? And I think what Paul is saying, that you're asking those questions, hey, don't worry, dad's coming home. Dad's coming home and dad's not gonna be able to take away what has happened to you in the past, but God will be able to redeem it for your future. Dad's coming home. You see, God doesn't remove our suffering. What God does is redeem our suffering. He redeems it. Our suffering isn't pointless. He continues in verse six. He says, in his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you and God will provide rest. Say rest. Peace. Peace. Who doesn't want rest? Who doesn't want peace? He says, God will provide peace. He will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us. When? When the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. You catch that? Not today, not tomorrow, but when dad comes home. When Jesus comes back and he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, sounds like a little bit of revelation, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. And when he comes on that day, he will receive glory from his holy people, praise from all who believe. And this includes you, for you believed what we told you about him. Dad is coming home. Dad is gonna make everything right. And listen, he doesn't promise to remove our suffering, he promises to redeem it. He doesn't promise to heal us, he promises to help us. He doesn't promise to eliminate it, he promises to elevate it. That's what his promise is. And so the suffering that we are experiencing, the hardship we're experiencing is preparing us for what is next. Because God already knows what's next. We don't. I mean, sometimes we lose sight of the right kingdom. I mean, we're in a series called Between, and when we're living between these two kingdoms, sometimes it's easy to lose sight, and Paul writes this about this to the, the church in Corinth, and listen to what he says, he said, that's why we never give up. I mean, though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day, for our present troubles are small, and they won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now, rather we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last, how long? Forever. Forever and ever and ever. God is working in the middle of your suffering. And listen to how he wraps up verse 11 and 12. He says, so we keep on praying for you, asking our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. May he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. Then the name of our Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live. And you will be honored along with him. This is all made possible because of the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. And so while you're waiting, while you're going through it, when you're in the midst of your troubles and your hardship, life gets bumpy. In the meantime, don't quit. Live a life worthy of your calling. He will give you the power. He will help you to overcome. And so I think Paul is saying to this young church, he's going, I'm proud of you. Way to go, you're getting your teeth kicked in every single day, but man, here's what I see in you. You have a flourishing faith. You have a, a growing love. Keep calm and carry on, and don't you ever forget, no matter how bad it gets, that dad is coming home. And when he comes, all things will be made right, amen? And listen, I don't know what you've walked in here with today, but here's what I know. I know in a room this big, I know with the hundreds of thousands who are watching online or other campuses right now, I know there's some bumpy roads in some lives right now. I know some of you are going through some stuff right now. I know some of you are probably asking some questions. Why is this happening to me? God, why are you allowing this in my life right now? 
Maybe you're experiencing some suffering. Maybe you're dealing with some soul-crushing defeats. Maybe right now your marriage is tough. You're looking for a glimmer of hope. Maybe right now in your health, it's, it's every day waking up going, what's next? What's gonna fail tomorrow? Maybe right now it's an addiction. It just seems like no matter how hard you try, it just has a grip on you. Maybe it's a sin in your life that you just feel handcuffed to. And it's creating a shame and a guilt in you because the enemy is whispering in your ear that you're not good enough. You don't deserve the grace and love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Maybe you just buried someone you love. Maybe you're dealing with the consequences of a bad decision. Listen, my hope as you're going through these bumpy times, is that you keep calm and you carry on and, and you, you keep a firm grip on the handlebars, the handlebar of a, of a flourishing faith and a growing love because we need those. It's the only way that we're gonna get through, the only way we're gonna grow, the only way we're gonna realize that God is redeeming the situation, the suffering and using it in our lives. We have to hold on to those handlebars of a flourishing faith and a growing love. And don't think that just your faith is enough and let go and you're riding with just one hand on. And so many people, so many people say, I, I got this, it's me and God. And let go of that one handlebar of community. We were never designed to go through hard times alone. We need both hands on. Keep calm, don't panic, carry on, and never forget, dad's coming home. And when dad comes home, everything, and I mean everything, will be made right. So here's what I want you to wrestle with this week. What is one step? What, what is one thing that you can do in your life to, to grow a calm spirit and lean into what God has planned for you? I want you to think about that. What is one thing you can do this week to lean in to that calm spirit to be able to grab a hold of what God has in store for you? And I'm telling you, the second, the second book is, is gonna be just as powerful as the first. And next week, if you like end times conversations, it's gonna be all end time stuff. So we're gonna get our revelation all next week, all right? So come in ready for that. It's gonna be fun. Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you and we need you, especially when it comes to this message because it's so easy for us to think that when hard times, when difficulties come, when we face persecution and difficulty and problems and, and heartache in life, that, that it's pointless. But Jesus, our hurt and our pain is never pointless. You're always using it to grow us, to mature us, to help us to learn and become complete so that we never lose hope. I pray for everyone in this room who's going through a bumpy spot. I pray they'll hold on to those handlebars of a flourishing faith and a growing love. I pray that they will keep calm and they will just carry on and, and hold on to those things and know that this, these problems we're facing, these light and momentary problems, they're gonna fade away but they're doing something in us to prepare us for, for what's next. And I pray that we would find honor in our suffering and that we would recognize, no, we're never gonna be able to do it on our own. We're, we're never gonna be able to get through this on our own, but you don't leave us alone. You're there for us. And so Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the work that you're doing in us and through us in these times. So help us to not have a perspective on the here and now but to continue to build that perspective, looking towards the future, our forever with you in heaven. Jesus, we love you and we need you. And so less of me, more of you. It's in your name we pray, amen.